Hey, I uh, work here at Lakeland University, and uh, I have the uh, privilege of moderating this session, which is uh, the classroom from theory into practice. And we have two presentations today. Uh, the first one by uh, Gareth Price, which is improving article accuracy in raising metalinguistic awareness. And uh, the second one listed in your program by uh, <coughs> Todd LaRue will not uh, take place uh, in that he's uh, had to cancel for some reason. After uh, Mr. Price, we will move on to uh, James Parker and Ryan Rochelle, who will present on uh, teaching ideology and hegemony in the transcultural classroom. What all this means in terms of time is we've got some <coughs> extra time, so I think we just allow the presenters to stretch it out to as much as a half an hour if they want. But after each session, I think we'll have questions to that particular presenter or presenters. And then, of course, at any point, if you have a question for the other group, uh, that would be fine as well. Okay? So without further ado, uh, why don't we... Yeah, would you want to... Uh, me, uh, uh, sure. What, what are we trying to do? We're trying to uh, hook this up. Mm -hmm. Technical okay. assistance here. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, I see a light coming on. It's warming up. Okay. Can you dim the lights at all? Uh, would, would you prefer to have the lights dim a little bit? Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. You know what that is? Yeah. How's that seem? Is that okay? Okay. Uh, presenters, I will uh, give you a, a auspicious signal when we're five minutes from five minutes and then one minute to let you know. Such as it is, an auspicious signal. Something like this. <laughs> like a five, uh, the number five and the number one. How's that sound? <laughs> That's okay. Um, so, good morning. Uh, before I begin, I just want to say apologies for my voice. Um, I've come down with a certain case of a bit of a cold and a dodgy voice, so I'm going to try and do my best to spread it around this tiny room, uh, speaking <laughs> as loudly as possible. So, uh, apologies for that. Uh, so, good morning. Uh, my name is Gareth Price. Um, so I'm an English teacher working at CELE, which is the Center for English Language Education at Asia University, and it's in um, Masashino City, which is uh, just down the road from here on the Chura Line. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about a topic that has been an interest of mine for a number of years, uh, and that is how to improve article accuracy amongst Japanese learners of English. Uh, so that being how Japanese learners of English can improve use of definite and indefinite articles, ah, and the. So this presentation is going to fall into roughly four parts. So I'll begin by stating my research goal. Then I'll outline some of the problems with article use. Uh, after that, I'll explain the research I performed. And then I'm going to finish with talking about how that research could have some practical applications for the classroom. So I've been teaching in Japan for just over seven years now. And I remember when I first came, the one thing that really struck me was uh, how Japanese students really struggled with the English articles. Um, I was kind of shocked by it. I wasn't quite ready for how much of a problem they had using a ah, and the. Um, the kind of problems that causes for their writing, for their speaking, for their communication. Uh, so that since then, I've been interested in you know which technique is best to try to improve uh, Japanese learners' use of articles and how how we can best improve their accuracy. Uh, so well, you know, first I suppose you might ask uh, why. 
Uh, so, well, my goal is to improve students' accuracy with articles. So, again, you know, I, I really want to try to find the best way to do this, uh, whether that be certain teaching methodologies, certain, mm, certain other techniques from previous researches. So, why improve article accuracy? Well, uh, first, articles in English are amongst the highest frequency words. Uh, so the corpus of contemporary American English has the as the highest frequency word, and a as the fourth highest frequency word in the English language. Uh, so unfortunately for students, there's just absolutely no avoiding articles, no matter how much they might try. Uh, so secondly, uh, because they're such high frequency words, Mistakes with articles come much thicker and faster than they would with other you know, less frequent uh, grammar, less frequent vocabulary. Uh, so it holds the speaker at an artificially low speaking level because those mistakes keep cropping up continually. Uh, next, also, um, sometimes uh, it marks the speaker as a non native. Uh, for example, you know, native speakers will never make a mistake with articles. You know, native speakers might often make mistakes with uh, you know, countability, or they might make mistakes with certain grammar tenses, but very rarely will you uh, get a, a native speaker who makes mistakes with English language articles. So this is something that is a big problem for those students who want to become more native in their speech. And uh, finally, Sometimes uh, making mistakes with articles can cause communication errors. So for example, uh, if I go home tonight to my wife, and instead of saying, uh, you are the woman I love, I make a mistake and say, you are a woman I love, <laughs> well, <laughs> speaks for itself. Uh, OK, so uh, next, I want to talk about the problems with article use. And I'll talk about this first from the perspective of students, and then from the researcher's perspective. So I surveyed some of my freshman English students uh, about the problems they had with articles. And uh, amongst other things, they told me uh, there are too many rules. Uh, there are also too many exceptions to those rules. Uh, only native speakers can use articles. And uh, somewhat strangely, even my teacher makes mistakes. I'm not sure which teacher they were talking about there. Uh, so, you know, already looking at these, you can see that students have already um, thought of articles as something that is just inherently too difficult for them. Uh, they kind of build it up to this level where they believe that it's something they cannot master, you know, no matter how much they try, only native speakers can use articles, too many rules, something they believe they'll never get the hang of. Uh, so, now, there's been a lot of previous research about articles in English, uh, but today I just want to focus on uh, noun classification, teaching methods, and the differences between Japanese and English. So looking at uh, noun classification first of all, students often have a problem with whether a noun is singular, plural, countable, or uncountable. So in fact, uh, research here by Selson Mercia and Larson Freeman uh, cited that um, the category of noun is one of the most important factors determining whether a student can accurately use an article with that noun or not. Uh, oops, excuse me. So also, uh, Ogawa found that uh, there is an overuse of the word the, and this is done as a strategy by the students to avoid making countability judgments. Uh, so, for example, rather than deciding whether a sentence should be I'd like a cake please, or I'd like cake please, uh, students would try to get around this by saying I'd like the cake. So, inserting the when actually it's not necessary. So they believe it can, they can avoid making mistakes with countability. Uh, so, next I'd like to talk about some of the uh, uh, teaching methods that have been employed to try to improve article accuracy. Uh, firstly, the yakudoku or the grammar translation method. So this is where students are taught to analyze a sentence and break it down into 
parts that correspond to equivalent sentences in Japanese. Uh, so, according to Humphrey, uh, this can cause students to make false collocations between certain articles. So they make the mistake of believing that certain articles are always connected to certain nouns. Right? And this can have a problem for overuse. Uh, in the same way, so White argued that uh, teachers should, excuse me, teachers do try to assign certain hard and fast rules uh, for articles. And actually, they don't teach that context is important for article use. So uh, White argued that you should teach article flexibility rather than try to focus on fixed rules. And uh, finally, when teaching grammar, some students and teachers become fixated on mistakes. Uh, but however, this can just lead to students becoming uh, more and more fixated on those mistakes and kind of tensing up, not wanting to speak for fear of making mistakes. Uh, however, Venuti argued that uh, we should teach metalinguistic awareness. So teachers should make students aware that during certain points in their learning, certain mistakes are natural to make. And this could ease students' minds so that they don't worry about making those mistakes because actually it's a natural part of the learning process. Uh, next, in the previous research, I'd like to mention the differences between Japanese and English. Of course, um, there are a lot of differences between Japanese and English, but I'm just going to mention a few that are pertinent to this research. Uh, first, it's been seen that Japanese learners of English tend to omit articles uh, because of negative L1 transfer. So, unfortunately, there's nothing exactly like articles in Japanese. Nothing behaves exactly the way that articles do in English in Japanese. Uh, next, so, uh, Japanese is what's called a topic prominent language, whereas uh, English is a subject prominent. Uh, so what this means is that once a noun is introduced in the comment part of a section on, excuse me, the comment part of a sentence, on the next utterance it moves to the topic part. Uh, and in Japanese the topic position is already semantically marked as definite. So it doesn't need an article to be shown as definite. Okay. Uh, also, uh, in Japanese definiteness and indefiniteness, excuse me, are uh, used by showing the topic markers wa and ga. Uh, again, these topic markers don't correspond exactly to definiteness and indefiniteness in English. And lastly, uh, learners uh, try to directly translate from their L1. Uh, so it was found that these students try to attribute a like-for-like -like meaning, uh, similar to what we saw with the Yakudoku translation method, they try to assign a fixed rule to a, a word in English and a word in Japanese. So unfortunately, this is restricting the <coughs> article meaning. And again, like we saw, we should try to teach that context is most important for article use. We shouldn't try to assign fixed rules, and we shouldn't rely on them being a like-for-like -like translation between Japanese and English. So now we've looked at some of the problems uh, highlighted in previous research, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about the research I conducted. I uh, enlisted the help of 37 participants who were recruited via a series of notices on uh, Japanese language message boards of um, various social networking sites. Uh, the research had just three stages. Uh, first, the participants would take an online gap fill test uh, that would assess their current accuracy with English articles. Uh, next, they would listen to a podcast lesson that I recorded. And then finally, they would take the same gap fill test again to see if any improvement had taken place. So the online test was based on a few different uh, researchers' studies, uh, as you can see over there. So the students had to choose which article would fit best in an A B conversation. Uh, so participants had to choose either a, the, or no article. 
And for the noun choice, I chose a mixture of concrete, abstract, and non-count nouns. Uh, so <clears throat> for these uh, for these A B conversations, uh, the conversations were based on five semantic contexts. So uh, excuse me. Uh, so the five semantic contexts were based on uh, Hubner's uh, semantic wheel. So each uh, question required the students to imagine the context of a noun in question. So whether it had been mentioned before in the conversation, whether it is known or unknown to the speaker. Okay. Uh, so in the first semantic context, So these are the five semantic contexts. Previous mention, speaker knowledge, lack of speaker knowledge, uh, speaker knowledge once more, and lack of hearer knowledge. So in the first semantic context, uh, the is used because the noun has previously been mentioned in the conversation, uh, as you can see here in this example. So the correct answer should be the. In context two, uh, again, the definite article is used because the speaker is referring to a specific noun that is known to them. So in this case, the noun foyer is both specific and definite. The next uh, context, lack of speaker knowledge, uh, again requires the use of the definite article. Uh, despite the noun not being specific or known to the speaker, uh, it is still definite. So, as in this example sentence. Now, the next two semantic contexts uh, both have the indefinite article as the target answer. So, in this case, uh, it's because the even though the noun is both specific and known, uh, actually it's not definite. And uh, finally, the fifth uh, semantic context again needs the indefinite article. Uh, as the noun is neither specific nor definite. And again, it's unknown to the hearer, it's a lack of hearer knowledge. So in the test, all of these semantic contexts, rather than the type of noun, uh, primarily affected whether the article should be a, the, or no article. So after, <laughs> after taking the test, for the first time, the students then listened to the podcast. So it was a 20-minute lesson which outlined the flexibility of articles and stressed the importance of nouns in the context of a conversation. So I tried to show the students that looking at the context of a noun in conversation would be a better strategy than worrying about the noun type or countability. Uh, students were given some test questions and had the opportunity to pause or rewind parts of the lesson. Uh, uh, also, there's, if the students had difficulty understanding the lesson, uh, actually the lesson script was provided in English and Japanese, and also the grammar points were translated into Japanese, just to account for some possible lack of understanding by the students. Uh, so now, I'm going to talk about some of the research findings. So here are the uh, results showing the percentage of correct answers uh, according to noun type. So uh, broken down into concrete, abstract, or non-count nouns. So as you can see, the percentage of correct answers actually goes up between test one and two for all the uh, excuse me all the noun types. Um, as you can see, concrete noun was answered the most successfully, followed by abstract, and then non-count, again, caused students the most problems, uh, as has been shown in a lot of the previous research. Uh, next, these are the results showing the correct answers by percentage according to article choice. So again, uh, between tests one and two, the accuracy increased for indefinite definite articles, and there was just a tiny increase when no article was the correct choice. Uh, finally, so these are the results broken down by the semantic context. 
So as you can see, the students became more accurate in all the semantic contexts except for uh, number two, which actually the accuracy fell slightly, uh, inexplicably, between uh, test one and test two, uh, just by one percent. There was a four. Uh, so, you know, why is this? Well, context two may have been difficult for students to identify. To identify this context correctly, students needed to supply the definite article. Uh, however, uh, this should have been based on a judgment of speaker knowledge or lack of speaker knowledge. Uh, namely, that the speaker knows exactly which specific noun is being referred to in the context of the conversation. So if you compare accuracy between context one and context two, there's a huge gap, you know, around a 20 or 25 percent gap between context one and context two, even though Correct answers in both cases are actually the. Uh, again, probably the reason, the reason I believe for this is, so context one was based on whether or not the noun had been mentioned previously. And actually, according to researchers, this is one of the key rules that students of English are taught how to assign definite articles in English. Whereas context two was a little bit more difficult having to put yourself in the position of the speaker or the listener in the context of the conversation. So uh, I'm going to summarize the findings here. So I found that both uh, noun type and semantic context were significant factors in whether the students could accurately uh, assign the correct article in the conversation. So students seem to have most difficulty in correctly uh, assigning non-count nouns. Similar to other researchers, I found that uh, students were wrongly using the definite article with non-count nouns. Again, perhaps this was an avoidance strategy of sorts. Uh, they were a little bit too worried about making errors with countability. So they were overusing the to try to get around those uh, potential pitfalls. Uh, likewise, students uh, had trouble assessing speaker knowledge in the context of a conversation. So actually they only had around 50% accuracy uh, using the definite article, the, when the choice was based on speaker knowledge. Uh, I think this is uh, because students found it hard to put themselves in the shoes of the people in the conversation. Uh, perhaps if students were able to create their own dialogues, um, it would be a little bit easier for them to imagine the context in which the conversation is taking place and therefore correctly assign based on speaker knowledge or hearer knowledge. So, however, between the first test and the second test, uh, the students got much more accurate with their article use. However, uh, the results were just slightly um, painfully outside the range of statistical significance. Uh, so I think this is based on a number of factors, primarily uh, due to the rather small sample size. Uh, so does this uh, have any practical use for the classroom? Well, I believe that we should try to teach students to consider more contextual clues when thinking about articles. So we could try exercises where students have to make guesses based on hearer or speaker knowledge before choosing the correct article choice. So I think students might gain a clearer grasp of the concept uh, if they were to make dialogues of their own rather than trying to decipher pre-made conversations from a textbook. Also. Uh, students were focusing on countability too much, so often the students didn't realize that actually it was the semantic context that made the difference in which article was the correct choice. So I think that you know, we could be teaching students to check for countability as a final step before considering the semantic context of the conversation. Uh, finally, in my research, even though participants only had a 20 minute lesson, actually they were able to make some pretty big improvements. Uh, so I think if these strategies 
were built into lessons or uh, built into the curriculum over time, I think that students could change their way of thinking and improve article accuracy in a more meaningful and long-lasting way. Uh, so before I finish, uh, I'd like to ask if you have any thoughts on this. So um, my research, as you've seen, was uh, far from perfect. Uh, there's a lot I could improve and a lot of things I probably didn't even consider uh, when making this research. So uh, I'd like to ask if you have any opinions or experience or advice. Uh, you know, I'd love to hear this and maybe your thoughts on how you teach students about articles, uh, any problems your students have, or any possible tips for uh, my further research. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Uh, it seems we have plenty of time for questions, so uh, please uh, let's ask away. Mm. I'm, I'm just kind of curious, uh, oh. at, at your school situation, do you actually mm -hmm. specifically teach articles as a, as a lesson within itself? Not within itself. It crops up. Um, it crops up in the curriculum, you know, based on the textbook. Um, Sometimes if the students are having problems and kind of if time allows, I'll take a couple of lessons out to, to go over this kind of thing, trying to get them to focus on the context of an article rather than, you know, I think when students get to kind of you know, university level, they bring a lot of the, the kind of the previous ways they've been taught with them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of students, are, I think they've already got this fixed idea of when they should be using the, when they should be using our. So I, you know, I tried to take a little bit of time out, but it, sometimes it's not possible. So the way you, say, before you did this research, yeah. the way that you taught, uh, has it differed in a way from now post research in the way you're yeah. teaching? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like um, I didn't realize how how much students rely on accountability or how worried they are for accountability. I mean that that. Um, you know, so count and non-count nouns crops up naturally in our curriculum, mm -hmm. and students always freak out about it. And I had no idea kind of how much they did, and I didn't realize what the kind of detrimental effect it was actually having on you know accurately using nouns according to this research. What kind of level are the students? Um, they're now that's a little bit tricky. Uh, they're I guess what we would call pre-intermediate, but okay. some you know some of the students. Uh, still have conversation and have real problems. So this would be the level of those that did the research as well? Yes, uh, actually the, the research, um, at the time I, I couldn't use my university students um, and I decided to use people whom I hadn't met. That's why I kind of recruited online. Mm. I, I didn't want there to, for, for there to be a, a worry of the students about making mistakes. I was kind of worried that already the students are kind of tensing up about using this grammar correctly or not correctly. So that was one of the reasons why I chose to kind of get them from outside the university. And as it turned out, they were uh, mostly actually adult students you know, who, were, who had been studying English through like a Kiowa or you know, those, those kind of like private lessons or business lessons. That kind mm -hmm. of thing. They were all Japanese. Yeah, yeah, they were all Japanese native speakers. Yeah, the, they were recruited by uh, sort of putting Japanese language ads on different networking sites. That's how, that's how I found them. That's interesting. Oh, thanks. Would you think of, um, to avoid that problem of mm. sort of offending some of your own students, yeah. could you possibly take another university and that university? Mm studies your students oh, and vice yeah. versa. That way you take that away. Right, that might be nice. And uh, yeah. you know, if, if I could if I were doing it for example, yeah. I could say it's not my fault, it's Price's fault. Right. <laughs> so direct all the anger yeah. towards towards you in this case. Yeah, yeah. But getting I, I great presentation by the way. Really really nice. Um, I think well something you said in the beginning mm. about how natives don't make these kinds of mistakes, right. no matter what their level of education. Mm. Do you think perhaps there's room for trying to uh, simulate that in your students by bringing in a reading element? Mm. So there's a natural... Uh, I see. I'll, I'll tell you what the problem is. Mm. Um, high school, junior high school, these kids have had six textbooks 
and they still they still don't remember SVO, SVO plus M plus C when they're yeah. speaking or writing. Mm. So I think anything in term which sort of simulates that system mm. has very limited results. Mm. I think it really needs a sort of a rational to be to be honest, I basically say to them that's simulated learning English. Oh, I see. And well you can't throw out their learning practices. That right. would be foolhardy to, to ignore that six years. But I think the approach has to be radical if you're going to bring about change. And I think maybe one way is to try with the thing you were doing there, yeah. but <coughs> sort of a natural element mm. that would combine the both. Through like a extensive reading? Yeah. yeah. That could be interesting. Yeah, um, actually there's a, a couple of teachers at my university that do use a kind of extensive reading program alongside the freshman English. So actually at our university there's um, kind of two, two freshman English styles. We have a four a week class and a five a week class. So a lot of the teachers who teach a five a week class, for the fifth day they, they do a kind of extensive reading. Mm -hmm. But actually I only teach a four, a, four uh, days a week, unfortunately, because I'd love to do some, something like that. Yeah. I think that could be really interesting. Maybe you could do it over the uh, semester mm. and give them a book at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, not in, you're not going to judge them on it. Right. Sort of thing, just as it's an aid. It's a yeah, learning just aid. a kind of like an extra. Yeah. And maybe let them choose the book to yeah. read. Mm, that could be interesting, I think, actually. Thanks for that. So, your research focused on um, speaking skills, but I'm yeah. sort of curious if you can see an application for, for writing in particular. You know, in our writing classes, we do a lot of peer review, yeah. and students tend to be okay at mm. finding article errors in their peers' papers, but can't transfer that to when they uh, actually write. And I'm wondering if you could yeah. sort of see an application for what you've done here in that yeah, situation. I, I could imagine doing that. I um, yeah, actually, I did teach a writing class last year, but unfortunately, this year I'm not teaching it. Uh, but yeah, I I could imagine that I. Had, I had exactly the same experience that they they were quite good at finding their peers' um, mistakes, but you know, again, I didn't find much improvement with their own.